Well, hello to all of you wherever and whenever you might be celebrating Easter Sunday today in your house church. Within the regular annual rhythms of the Christian calendar, today is one of the biggest and most poignant days of the year as we remember and rejoice and continue to realize the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who died on a cross, is now alive again. And although we're 2,000 years or so removed from the events that occurred at the resurrection, we have a lot in common with those who experienced the very first Easter Sunday themselves. And what's more, Jesus' message to them in that moment is just as applicable and powerful for you and for me in this moment as well. With that said, to help set the scene that we're about to parachute into today, I want to begin by describing a particular movie trend that's increasingly appearing in many modern blockbusters. The first time I saw this example was in 2008. I was at the movies watching Iron Man. And as the movie finished and the credits began to roll up the screen, I began to get, a, to get out of my seat when I noticed that no one else in the cinema was moving. It was as if they were waiting for something else to happen, even though the movie appeared to have finished. Experiencing all the effects of FOMO, the fear of missing out on something, I sat back down into my seat and I waited alongside everyone else. What followed as the last line of credits disappeared from the screen and just when I thought, from the, for, uh, just when I thought that the picture was going to fade to black, there was a glimmer of light that signaled that another scene was about to unfold. Now, this is what is commonly referred to as a post-credit scene. In this instance, Iron Man met a shadowy character called Nick Fury, and the ongoing story of the Marvel movie movement was launched. Post-credit scenes are interesting because they give us a glimpse of an interaction between characters that continues to advance a story at the very moment that we think it's all finished. They give us a hint that there is something more to come, something that transcends a moment and acts as a catalyst for a movement to begin. And this is what happens in the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection. When we read the Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it can be really easy to read through the events of Easter as if it's just one continual scene. But for the women and the men who walked and talked with Jesus, his death on a cross to them would have felt like the horrifying end to a story that had so much potential in the beginning. They weren't expecting a resurrection event on that first Easter Sunday. In their minds, in real time, the movement of Jesus finished in the moment of his death on a cross. They thought it was over. They thought all of their hopes and dreams had been crushed. But what all four gospel writers include next in each of their accounts is the ultimate post-credit scene. Because the moment of Jesus' resurrection signals the beginning of a movement that changes people's lives as they realize it for themselves. Now, with that said, today we're going to be camping out in John's account of Jesus' resurrection. So if you have your Bibles with you, you might want to start heading along to John chapter 20, where we'll begin in verse 19. In the sentences leading up to this moment that we're about to read, John paints a picture that's meant to invite us down to the human level and just to stand in astonishment with him at an empty tomb. The first person on the scene in his account is Mary Magdalene. Discovering an empty tomb, she runs and fetches two of the disciples who investigate the matter themselves. The burial clothes of Jesus are there, but there's no body to be found. And so they returned to where they were staying, confused around what was happening. In John's gospel, Mary then encounters Jesus outside of the tomb on her own. And eventually she realizes that it's actually him. But Jesus sends her to the rest to join the rest of the disciples and tell them about what she's seen with her own eyes and heard with her own ears. And that's exactly what she does. Then it becomes the evening. 
of this momentous day. And these are the words that John uses to describe what happens next. In your Bibles, John chapter 20, verse 19, through to the end of the chapter, let's read this together. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. As John has just described the scene that's unfolded, the disciples find themselves in a similar situation to that of our own today. They're behind closed doors, separated from much of the uncertainty and the chaos that's going on out there or or out there or out there or wherever outside is for you. To be clear, the reasons for their self-isolation are really different to our own. They were afraid of persecution from the Jewish leaders who only a few days earlier had orchestrated a rigged judicial process to murder Jesus. But they were isolated nonetheless. And the experience and the effects of isolation, they can affect anyone regardless of the cause for it. So when Jesus shows up in the midst of their isolation and their confusion and their uncertainty, the first words that he utters to them are incredible and we should take note of them for ourselves. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, this was a typical Jewish greeting, similar to us kind of saying, g'day, mate, to each other. But whenever Jesus spoke about peace, it had a far deeper meaning than just a friendly greeting. And he spoke about peace a lot. Earlier in John's gospel, Jesus is recorded as promising that peace would be the gift that he offers to those who know him. One scholar suggests that Jesus' use of the term peace in this passage in particular, it's a blessing. It's It's a declaration that the peace of God has now been made accessible for all through Him. But this peace, it relates to more than just the absence of conflict or hard times. If we take a deeper look behind the languages from which we have the translated word peace, a richer meaning is revealed. In the New Testament of the Bible, we get the term peace from the Greek word arene. And in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word shalom. One lexicon, which is basically a dictionary for biblical words. It defined this kind of peace that Jesus speaks about as the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, fearing nothing and content with its earthly lot, whatever sort that is. So when Jesus says, Peace be with you. He says it with the power and authority because it was through his death on a cross that the broken relationship between humans and their creator can be restored to wholeness. When Jesus declares peace to someone, 
It brings with it a deeper understanding and meaning of wholeness and completeness. It's a sense of things being made right and us becoming who we were made to be regardless of external circumstances. So this peace from Jesus, it can be experienced when we're behind closed doors because of persecution or because of a pandemic. After declaring peace over them, Jesus shows them the wounds on his hands and on his side from the crucifixion because they're the evidence that explains this source of peace. In the Old Testament, a man called Isaiah forecasted this very moment right here when he poetically announced that the punishment that brought us peace was on him, Jesus, and by his wounds, we are healed. Through Jesus, our sins can be forgiven and we're given a fresh start, the opportunity to begin again in our relationship, in our life's orientation towards God. And this is the peace that is available to you and to me because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his scars prove it. But that's not the end of the scene yet. Because with Jesus' very next words, he repeats his blessing and promise of peace. And then he links it to a movement of peace that we're all invited to join. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. His peace is now theirs to experience. But it's not just an experience that was meant to be exclusive to just those people in that room. In the same way that God the Father sent His Son Jesus for us all, Jesus sends us to others to save them. Not to save them, but to share the message that in Jesus, peace can be found. In the next couple of verses, Jesus then unpacks and gives a bit of an insight into what partnering with God in this peace mission to the world involves. The bare basics of what Jesus has to say in verses 22 and 23, upon which there's a little bit of Uh, disagreement, but there's a lot, the general consensus among scholars is that firstly, Jesus sends us, not on our own, but with His empowering presence, the Holy Spirit. And secondly, as we share God's message of peace with all of its meanings and its implications to a muddled and confused and rebellious world, there will be some who receive it and there will be some who will reject it. And this is the mission for all who would seek to follow Jesus. We're invited to experience peace in Him and we're also sent to carry His message and movement of peace to a world that is desperate for it. The confronting question which which all Christians need to consider for themselves is whether that is the reputation that we have in the eyes of others. Are we known as people of peace. If others knew that we were followers of Jesus, would they want to follow him for themselves because of their experience and their example of our lives? In my life, I know that there's heaps of room for improvement in this area. And I suspect that the same is true for you as well. Oftentimes, the things that we say and the things that we do, or the things that we fail to say and do, They disturb the peace instead of proclaiming it. Our lives are are never perfect reflections of the perfect example of Jesus and his message of peace. But the great news is that Jesus' declaration of his peace to be with us enables us to begin again, no matter how many times we stuff it up. The confronting thing, though, is whether we actually believe what we've heard about Jesus for ourselves. It can be easy to hear about the peace Jesus brings to our lives and how it enables us to begin again even when we stuff it up. But but to believe it to be true, to live in light of this transformative peace, that can often be a bit of a stretch for some of us, particularly if we harbour a certain degree of doubt. Now, to be clear, throughout the Scriptures, doubt is not necessarily a bad thing. Because doubt is often the doorway to a deeper and more enriched belief as we work through it. And this is why I love how John, with his very next words in this account, reintroduces us to a character who is not quick to believe the message about Jesus, but is rather a little resistant to it. 
Here's how John describes this person called Thomas. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, Thomas receives a whole lot more attention in John's gospel than in the other three gospels of our Bible. And he always comes across as someone who has got a lot of questions and to be honest, has a, little, has a bit of a negative perspective on things. He's a, he's a realist, not an optimist. And some of you can probably relate a little bit more to him than to others. And, and that's okay. While he often cops a bit of criticism and over time picked up the unfortunate, the unfortunate nickname of Doubting Thomas, it can be easy to forget that he hasn't seen what the other disciples already have. And so when he gives expression to his doubts and the conditions that it will take for him to move through them, he's only really asking for the same evidence that they had just in a slightly more dramatic way. Now, although Thomas has to sit with his doubts for some time, what's fascinating is that Jesus shows up in the midst of his doubts and this changes everything for Thomas. Here's how John records what happens next. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. You know, we're never told exactly what Thomas does when Jesus shows up with the same consistent message, peace be with you. Whether Thomas kind of personally inspected the wounds in Jesus' hands and his side, or whether just the mere sight of them was enough to lead him through his doubt, at the end of it all, Thomas experiences Jesus in an eye-opening way. And he responds by expressing and acknowledging who Jesus is in an authentic and genuine way. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. This is a statement of belief. It's a statement of trust and relationship. And it's Thomas's heartfelt response when he realizes who Jesus is, what that means for him and how his life will forever be changed because of it all. This was how Thomas responded to the history-changing events of the very first Easter Sunday. But what might be your response? If the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive, how might you respond? If Jesus declares that he's life-changing, wholeness-making, sin-forgiveness, relationship with God, restoring peace can be with you, how might you respond? If Jesus declares this peace for you and then sends you out as a messenger of this peace to a world that desperately needs it, how might you, how might we respond? Well, we'll finish with what a response could look like really soon. But some of you are watching and listening right now and you might continue to identify a lot more with some of the questions and doubts that Thomas himself had. For whatever reason, and I'm sure that it's valid, your doubt is currently holding you back from fully believing in who Jesus is. Well, if that's you, then Jesus has got a word of blessing for you that he first uttered to Thomas. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what's Jesus saying here? Well, it's a gentle reminder that Thomas is in a privileged position because he can see with his own eyes some evidence that proves Jesus is alive. But the blessing that Jesus utters is more of an encouragement to those who come later, people like you and I, who weren't in that physical room with Thomas and the other disciples. We're blessed if we believe, not because we see evidence with our own eyes, but because we trust and are convinced by the words and the testimony of people like Thomas and of John. In fact, this is the reason that John wrote his gospel in the very first place. In the very next lines of this passage, this is what John writes. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's hope was that after reading his words about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we might have a similar response to Thomas's. Because John came to be utterly convinced that Jesus was who he said he was, that he died on a cross and a few days later came back to life. And John, along with the other disciples and many, many others, came to be utterly convinced that Jesus' declaration of peace was real and transformative in their lives. And so they responded accordingly. And John's hope is that in time, you might come to be convinced as well that you might believe that Jesus is alive, that you might believe Jesus' declaration of peace over your life. John's hope for you is that by believing in Jesus, you might come to experience life in His name. When we put our faith in Jesus, it's more than just believing the right things about Him. It's also about experiencing relationship with Him. And Jesus' invitation to you, as it is for everyone, is to step into and then stay in relationship with Him because He's done everything else that's needed to be done. And so today, on this Easter Sunday, what might be your response to this invitation from Jesus? If you want to step into relationship with Jesus for the very first time, or if you want to reaffirm your continued commitment to stay in relationship with Jesus, Well, what might be your response to Jesus today? If you want some words to maybe help articulate a response, how about we borrow a little bit from Thomas, who himself responded to this invitation from Jesus. A simple prayer that you might like to pray is simply this. Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. In a prayer like this, it's not the words that matter. It's the heart and the intention behind them. So are you wanting to experience the life that is found in Jesus' name? Well, why don't you pray this prayer? Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. Do you want to experience the peace that Jesus declares over those who believe in him? Well, why don't you pray this prayer? Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. In fact, even if you've got doubts that might be getting in the way of going all in in relation to Jesus, why not pray this prayer as you begin to move through those very doubts? Because I'm convinced that Jesus wants to meet you in the midst of them. Simply pray, Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. So this prayer is going to pop up on the screen and it's going to stay there for a little bit so that you can keep your eyes on it. And I'm going to pray this prayer for myself because I want it to continue to be true in my life. And if you want it to be true for you as well, why don't you pray it as well? as you step into a relationship with Jesus, maybe for the very first time, or maybe if you pray it as a continuing prayer, as you step back into or to stay in relationship with Jesus, why don't you pray this prayer along with me silently in your minds? In light of this pandemic moment that we find ourselves in, on this incredible day in the Christian calendar, the peace that Jesus offers That's the peace that we need and that's the peace that this world needs. Why not in this moment we join this movement or reaffirm our commitment to this movement of peace that Jesus has for all those who follow him? All you have to do is simply pray this prayer to begin, to take that first step. Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. You might want to just 
silently repeat those words in your mind as an internal articulation of a decision that you want to move on. I'm going to pray it for myself right now. You might want to join along. Jesus, my Lord and my God, I desire your peace in my life. Amen. Hey, if you prayed this prayer of invitation to God and you committed yourself to him for the very first time or maybe the first time in a long time or in response to something that's currently going on in your life, it would be great if you could let someone know. One way that you can do this is that you can click a link that's going to pop up in the description of this video on YouTube or you can simply visit our connect link me.sb.org.au and in your browser and then just hit the respond button. Here, you can ask any questions that you might have. You can talk to someone about Jesus or maybe learn more about what it means to follow him. What will happen is that you'll submit a short form letting us know whether you want to talk with one of our team via Zoom or maybe over a phone call or on Facebook Messenger. All you'll need to do is just enter some basic details so that we can get in touch with you. If you're watching this on Easter Sunday morning, you can expect a response within a few minutes. If you're watching this at any other time, we're still going to get in contact with you, but it just might take a little bit more time. But as we finish up our time together in Sindel Baptist Church House Churches Online, let me just speak over you some words that were first written by Paul to some Christians in Philippians. These are his words. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May you live differently because of the peace that you have in Jesus, regardless of what happens today or tomorrow. Thank you for taking the time on this Easter Sunday to join your house church with the broader community of house churches here at Sindel Baptist Church. We hope to see you soon. Until next time, grace and peace.